Hey everybody, today's service is starting in one minute. And today we continue our series about the world of Jesus with a teaching titled of Conservatives and Liberals. So let's find our seats, turn our phones on silent, and let's get ready to worship our Lord. everybody and welcome to this morning's worship experience. My name is Alyssa and I'm so excited to welcome each and every one of you to today's service. If you're joining us for the first time, I do want to encourage you to please fill out one of those connect cards which you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you. And if you're joining us online, please comment down below or hit that like button to let us know that you're here. For tithes and offerings, you can send an e-transfer to VPCC Treasurer at Outlook.com, or you can place your tithes and offerings in the boxes located here in the sanctuary. Well, it's October, and we are super excited for the events and things coming up here in Vantage Point. First of all, we are starting to collect things for Stuff the Turkey and Trunk and Treat. So if you want to donate non-perishable items for our Edmonton Food Bank, you can start bringing those in and place them into our Stuff the Turkey box. Or if you want to bring in candies to support Trunk and Treat, you can place those things in our Trunk and Treat box. Also, we're still looking for volunteers. So if you would like to volunteer for Trunk and Treat, please come talk to myself or sign up at the sign-up sheet in the front foyer. Our church is in need of some good deep cleaning. So on Saturday, November 2nd, starting at 10 a.m., we're coming together to clean up our church. We are looking for people who want to come out and help wash walls and windows and just give this church some the love that it needs. So if you can come out, it's going to be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Bring yourself a bag lunch. And if you want to have more, if you need more information about this event, please talk to Les Eyestone or Tanya Fedora. And just lastly, guys, this is a reminder, small groups continue to happen throughout the month, and you can check out the small groups by checking out your bulletin when you join us in person. You can go online and check out our website for information there. You can also just go talk to some of the leaders here in the church, and they'll direct you to the right small group for you. It's never too late to join a small group, so I do want to encourage you to please join a small group today. And trust me, you will not be disappointed. For all their information, for events, for things happening here in the church, please be following us on Facebook. And check out our website, which is vantagepointcc.org. And if you join us in person, get yourself a bulletin. Now, let's get the service started.
start again. We hate our God, calling me your friend. Sing praise, my soul, to the maker of the sky. The sun will rise. I will sing a song of hope, sing along. God of heaven, come. Song of all, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Oh, sing a song of all, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know. is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair Bow down with care. God gave His Son to win the erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains fall God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to Adam's reign the saints and angels
so I, I'm, I'm going to just talk real quick. <laughs> One of the things that I really enjoy about being a part of a church is the fact that as Baptists we celebrate two significant things in the life of the church. The celebration of the Lord's Supper and baptism. The, the first one, the, the Lord's Supper, is something that God initiated through Jesus Christ to come into this world to take away our sin. And, and then we come as a church also to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to celebrate the fact that Jesus was prepared to give his life in order that we might have it eternally. And so that, that's a significant part of the church's life. The other thing is baptism. That's where we as people recognize the fact that we are sinners. And that through our baptisms, we align ourselves to Jesus Christ. And, and, and really so, the, the baptism is a reaffirmation that what Jesus came into this world, world to do has been recognized by us as his people. And so we come together as people of God to celebrate the fact that Jesus was prepared to go to the cross to save you and to save me. There's not a one of us that's any better nor any less worth of Jesus' life. So we've come together as his people to celebrate that and uh, I'm gonna invite uh, uh, some folk up here to help me along here. And uh, I've always found it interesting that when we, we come together as his people, we come to recognize the fact that we are all sinners and we've fallen short of the glory of God. But also through his death on the cross, his sacrifice, we are as his people recognize the fact that we cannot do it on our own. That Jesus has come that we might have life eternally and and then uh, after that we uh, we'll pass the bread out and then we'll eat it together all right the second thing that is the, the, the love of Christ he bled on the cross in order that he might give us life eternal and it's always been significant to me that there we come as his people not as Baptists not as anything else we come as his people to this table to celebrate the fact that he has given us the possibility to experience eternal life. And so uh, we're going to uh, invite people to come up and uh, I would invite you to take the bread and, and, the, and, the, and the cup and back to, and sit down and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, eat it together, all right? Your 
the only God whose power none can contend. You're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God, that's just the way it is. God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. You were God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You are God alone. Before time began, you were on your throne, you were God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you're unchanged. You're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, unchangeable. you're unshakable. Stop your stop that's what you Oftentimes we think of communion as something that we do for ourselves. And in reality, in the taking of the bread and the cup, we are aligning ourselves to the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus came into this world to save the world. And we get to be a part of that. So as we take this uh, bread and this cup, let's be reminded that this isn't just for us. Jesus came into this world to save the world, and we get to be a part of that. So let's take this bread and this cup and be thankful.
in Jesus' name. Amen. staying in with us as we talk about the love of Jesus this morning so that means we must have children's questions do we yeah we do okay good to know did you pick them out William yeah you did okay and you know all the answers so we'll be fine 
We'll ask these again after this. So if you don't know the answer now, you got some time to pick it up. So question number one, what are we supposed to give to God? I'll admit there's probably a couple of good answers here. So just be listening. By the way, anything that's in green writing during my sermon has something to do with you guys. Okay? I reserved it for you. Question number two, what kind of arguments do we waste time on? What kind of arguments do we waste time on? Number three, what valley do we walk through? Okay? Got that straight? You know all the answers already, right? Right, Josiah? You got it all down? Not quite yet? (laughs) Well, if you don't know the others, you can always just ask William because he picked out the questions. Um... (laughs) Okay, I happen to be a bit of an N.T. Wright guy. I like to read N.T. Wright and listen to him. And uh, If you don't know who he is, and I don't know why you would know who he is, uh, he is a theologian. Uh, he's a New Testament guy. He's actually an expert in Pauline writing. And so he, he's written a lot of books, and he speaks. And, and I just like reading him and listening to him. I think he's a pretty smart guy. We don't agree on everything. Now, you know, and that's okay. You know, it's okay not to agree with people. You can still like them, even if you disagree. You can still like me, even if we disagree on stuff, right? So, anyways, uh, I don't know how long ago it was. Seems like it was yesterday. It's probably a couple of years ago. Nelda and I were hosting her, um, her sister and her husband who were visiting us here. And one night, I don't know why, probably for some special, you know, dinner, we decided to go to Montana's. And um, so the four of us went to Montana's. We were sitting in one of the booths in, in Montana's, and we were doing what family does when you get together. We were talking about different things. I mean, didn't, every, nothing was off the table. We were talking about a whole bunch of different things. Um... At one point in this conversation, uh, they asked me if I watch 100 Huntley Street. Now, there are several things in this morning's message that will probably get me fired. So if I'm not here next week, you'll know what happened. Uh, And one of them is probably this. One thing you have to know about me is I'm really not a big fan of Christian television. Probably because I was brought up on the PTL club and some of those ones from the 70s, and they, you know, I have one really burned into me memory, this, the PTL club with Jim and Tammy Baker, and they were closing out their service. You see, their show was on about three o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep, so I was up watching it. I was probably a teenager at the time, and they had this quartet, and this quartet came out, and they started to sing the Easter song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's by Second Chapter of Acts from 1974. It's an old song now. Then it was fairly new, and it's got this bit of a, uh, of a beat to it. You know, hear the bells ringing, they're singing that Jesus, that we can be born again. It's, got, it's kind of peppy, it's fast, it's, it, 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 it's got this swing to it. And so they had this quartet, and they were closing off the PTL club, and they were going to sing the Easter song. And so I'm sitting there watching this television at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I know the Easter song. This quartet gets up to sing it, and they took the swing out of it. They slowed it down. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. And I'm going, please don't sing that. Please. No. Um, but they did. They sang the whole song. I listened to the whole song. And then at the end of the song, the camera cut to Tammy. I don't know whether, you, whether any of you know Tammy Baker have ever seen her before, but she was sitting there on the couch, mascara streaming down her face, crying her eyes out. And she says, please, please, can you sing that song again? 
and I'm going, please, please don't sing that song again. Luckily, they decided to cut to, you know, the, the credits, and they got out of there. So maybe it's just PTSD, but I, you know, I really don't like a whole lot of these Christians. So I've seen 100 Huntley Street. I don't watch it often. And so I kind of admitted that to my brother and sister-in-law. And they said, well, we saw this guy on Huntley Street, and his name was N.T. Wright. And I'm going, oh, N.T. Wright, I, that I can talk about. I like N.T. Wright. I don't like Huntley Street, but I, I like, I like N.T. Wright. And so we started talking about N.T. Wright and some of the things that he said. And the real surprise happened a few minutes later when the guy at the next table had to go to the bathroom. And so he got up from his table and turned towards the washroom. And to, to get to the washroom, he had to walk by our table. And so as he's walking by our table, he pauses and he says, what's your favorite N.T. Wright book? <laughs> and I, I paused uh, and I said, uh, actually, I just read it. It's surprised by hope. Um, Rethinking heaven, the resurrection, and the mission of the church. And he said, sorry, I, I was eavesdropping on your conversation. Then he went off to the bathroom, and that kind of ended that, that, that section of it. I bring this up because I was listening to N.T. Wright a few years back, and he was talking about politics and the church. And he said, in, in most countries, politics is fairly wide in the church. You can have people who believe from the, you know, the right to the left. Hopefully I got that right, because I'm trying to do it backwards on mine, you know. So from the right to the left, part of the spectrum, and, and, and you're still Christian. You're, you're, you're still allowed to believe. He says there's one country where I can ask a series of political questions, and by the end of that political discussion, I can tell you with about a 90% probability whether or not you're a Christian. He said, that happens nowhere in the world except in one country. The U.S., you're right. And we're becoming a little bit more like, now, again, reminder, N.T. Wright is from England, so, you know, that probably explains some of it. But, yeah, he said, the church is divided up politically. Left, right, conservative, liberal in one nation. And like I said, we are becoming more and, and more that way, as happens with a lot of things. We do follow the states. And his whole point was that that's not the way it, it should be. It shouldn't be that we are divided that way. That, that Christ can be the, the God, the, the Lord over all of us, even if we have political differences. So, I know there are people here that have very different political ideas than I do, but we can still be friends. That's the way the church is supposed to be. But sometimes, and it's becoming this way in the States, it's not the way that it is. So, somehow we need to have these hard discussions. So somehow we need to have this idea that we can have difficult, we, we can disagree and still be friends. That, that's okay. Even maybe on some strong things, we can disagree and be, and be okay. But it's not the way that the contemporary church seems to want to work. We have this idea in, in, in the contemporary church that everything should be one way, and, and if you don't do it my way, then I'm going to do something that, to make life hard on you until you believe it my way. It must have been over seven years ago because I've been out of school for you know, at least that long. But I was getting my master's degree and I went to a class on evangelism. And the first class, the, the, the prof gets up and he had given us some reading we were supposed to have done before the class started. And, and, and he said, well, let's go around the room. There was probably about 14 or 15 of us. Let's go around the room and talk about what you read and what kind of, you know, is good. And so I, we, we all kind of took our turns, and they started, and there's one book that the students of this class did not like. 
period. And we're going around this, this class and they're saying, well, I like this, I like what this guy said, but I don't know why you made me read this book. This is awful. And we, we're going around the class and it's getting closer and closer to me. And this book that everybody thought was awful was the only one that I felt was worth reading of what they had given to me. It was written by a guy named Brian McLaren. And they didn't like Brian, Brian McLaren. I didn't at the time even know Brian McLaren. I didn't know who he was. But the book on evangelism that he wrote, was discuss, it was discussions with an um, unchurched person. And I thought, wow, that, that is phenomenal. I like where this guy's going. So it comes to me, you know, you got to understand, everybody has trashed this book. And I go, yeah, I hate that Brian McLaren guy too. No, actually I didn't. <laughs> I said, well, I, you know, I, I understand you don't like him, but for me, that, that was the one that held the power. I thought that one was great. And again, sometimes it's just hard for us to have discussions around difficult topics. But one thing that Brian says, and he says this in A Generous Orthodoxy, which was not the book that I had to read for this class, but it's a different book by him. I've read this before, but just let me read it to you again. A key factor in the science of successful religious broadcast fundraising is fear. So that's it. You want to raise money? Instill fear. Make them scared. So listeners and viewers are told of a, less, of a vast left-wing conspiracies to destroy the family or to stamp out religious freedom. They are begged to help fight against the homosexual agenda or the secular humanism or postmodernism or terrorism or some other real or imagined bugaboo by sending in their tax-deductible donations for which they will receive an exciting premium, a genuine mustard seed in a cube of clear plastic. <laughs> and Brian's going, this isn't the way it should be. That's not the way we're, we're, we're supposed to be. Want to grow your church? Discover something that you can preach about that will instill fear in your congregation. And your church will grow. Problem is, it's not a church that I want to be connected with. I don't believe that's true. That we should be scared about anything. If God is for us, who can be against us? Go. A new command I give you. Love one another. By this they will know that you are my disciples. That you love one another that you support each other. Well, I want to look at a couple stories this morning from the Gospel of Mark. And just let me read the first story to you and then we'll discuss a little bit. So this is from Mark 12, verse 13. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to, to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. You teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Here's the question. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asks. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought him the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. That first blank is a people not swayed. We are supposed to be people who even in, in under pressure are willing to stand up for what we believe God is telling us to do. That's hard. 
especially if God starts leading us down roads where a few have gone before. Jesus was not swayed or trapped by the question. It was about tax. Now you need to understand, again, we're talking about two political groups. One was the Pharisees. The Pharisees are probably the closest group in the Bible to us. So just, I know that's hard to get your head around because we think this, the Pharisees were so bad, but they were people who were ethically correct. They liked to keep the rules. But they also believed that a Messiah was coming and that this Messiah would break the bondage that Rome had placed on them. In this, they were kind of like the zealots. They were just a little bit less fanatical than the zealots. And what they wanted was an Israel led by the Messiah that would be totally, totally belong to God. They wanted basically a godly nation. And sometimes we argue for the same thing. And the Pharisees believed that if all of Israel for just one day would do what is right and not break the law of Moses, that the Messiah would come and Rome would be defeated. And probably on the question of taxes, they, again, weren't as fanatical as the zealots, but they probably thought, you know what? We probably shouldn't pay taxes. Why should we strengthen Rome? The Herodians were appeasers. They were the ones that said, you know what? We just got to get along with Rome. So Rome demands a tax. Give them the tax. And Jesus knew this is what they're, what they're thinking. And no matter what Jesus said, somebody was going to be mad at him. And there was also going to be a way to destroy him. So what does Jesus do? He asks for a coin. And he looks at the coin and he says, whose image is this? And they said, it's Caesar's. And so Jesus said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God what belongs to God. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It's in green. But give to God what belongs to God. Genesis chapter 1 says you are created in the image of who? You're created in the image of God. God's image is stamped on you. Give the coin that is got the stamp of Caesar to Caesar, but give everything else in your life because you bear God's stamp to God. It's not easy, but it was a way of getting around the question that nobody ever thought of before. So sure, give your tax to, to the government, but allow the rest of your life to be given to God. Dan, I hope he's not going to get mad at me, sent me a video this week. Five controversial Christian takes from a Christian pastor that shouldn't be controversial Christian takes from a Christian pastor. It's kind of a long title. Um, I told you I was going to say some things that might get me fired, so you know, this, is, this is that section. Uh, he sent me this, this video and asked me, so what do you think of that? And I said, well, you know what? I think it's overstated. But I agree. And I know since I've already started this, I can't not give you the takes. So here they are. Take number one. Paul was not Jesus. We should probably stop worshiping, worshiping him. Yeah. Not sure that we worship Paul, but okay. Again, it, a lot of this depends on what you're, where you're going with this. If you're saying that the Pauline letters should be removed from the New Testament, no, I don't think so. They are God-breathed. They have been saved. They are, they are important for us to learn from. Uh, we have nothing that was written by Jesus. So everything was written by his apostles or the people that were around in the early church. So all we can do is, is live off of what these people wrote. But we believe that God has breathed this, 
that this scripture is important and that it gives us what we need to know to live. So, so should we worship Paul? No. And this guy says, you know, Paul wasn't Jesus. He wasn't a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a good teacher. But he was just a teacher. And sure, I agree with that. So we don't worship Paul, but we still read and learn from him. Take number two, women should absolutely be allowed to be clergy. Again, I've got no problem with that. They should be board members. They can be Grand Poobah if they want to be. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. In Christ, we are all one. There is no difference. There is no male and female in Christ. God has gifted us, whether we are male or female, he has gifted us and, and prepared us for something to do in his kingdom. I really believe that. So we, as Baptists ordain women, as Canadian Baptists of Western Canada, we ordain women. We have churches that are led by women. I have friends that don't like me and won't talk to me because I agree with this practice and they don't but that's really their loss not mine but sure I've got no problem with women being cler clergy take number three the Old Testament does not belong to Christians yeah uh, again where are you going with this would be my question um, the Old Testament was not written for Christians it was written for Jews now I'll tell you this I would much rather actually that we don't use the word Old Testament because that brings with it some connotations that maybe aren't strong. So I often use the idea of the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish Bible, or we call it what the Jews call it. They call it their Tanakh. And we can say, sure, this is your Tanakh. Does it have anything for us? It has lots for Christians. We should be readers of the Tanakh and of the Christian Testament. Um, Marcion was a heretic in the second century, and he put out a Bible that was basically the Gospel of Luke, a few um, letters from Paul, and that was it. And anything that mentioned the Old Testament, he cut out of it. <coughs> but, you know, and he was, he was declared a heretic. Um, there's, a, there's a story from a missionary about they gave this, this old guy a, a New Testament in his language, and he went home and he read through this Christian Testament that had been translated into his language. And then, and then after he had read the Christian Testament, he came back to the missionary and said, can I have the rest of the book? And the missionary said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's something missing. This is referring to something else. I want to know that too. And he was right. The, the New Testament refers to the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, whatever word you want to use for it. Um, it is important for us, but it does not belong to us. It's a Jewish document. I'm okay with that, as long as we understand what we're saying. <laughs> Take number four. The Trinity is not biblical. I think we have to define biblical. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Is there a Bible that says, that, or a verse that says, the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No, there isn't. But different verses in the Bible taken together refer us to the Trinity. So taken out of biblical sources, there is a Trinity. But no, there is no verse that specifies that. That's from studying and reading the Bible. <coughs> By the way, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are not biblical. There's no verse. There's no verse that tells you that abortion is wrong. We take that from a number of verses, some in the Psalms, some in, in other places where it says that God foreknew us, and say, if God fore, foreknew us, if he knew us while we were still in the womb, then to take life, to take that life is wrong. But the verse isn't there. It's because we've read the Bible, we've taken the Bible together, and it has, it has led us to this decision. And there are a lot of things that are like that. 
they are biblical in that they're taking from the Bible, but there's no Bible verse. And I think that's what this guy was getting at is we don't have a Bible verse for it. But that doesn't mean we don't teach it and we don't believe it. I go back to Genesis chapter 1. One of my favorite verses on the Trinity is the creation of, of us. And God says, let us make man in our image. It's plural. It's not single. It's not God saying, I'm going to make you in my image. It's God saying, I'm going to make you in our image. In the image of God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to make you. Male and female, I am going to make you. So we all bear the image of God. The Trinity on our lives. Take number five, the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. We can, again, this is a long discussion we probably can't have here. I'm running out of time already and haven't got to my first point. Um, But the problem with saying that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality is that's wrong. It does. We can argue about how those verses should be taken. And if you've talked to me about this issue, you know that's where I'm at. But we can't say the Bible doesn't condemn it. It does. It's just what do we understand those verses to mean. And that's all we can do. In fact, the homosexuality is mentioned seven times and five times is very clearly condemned. We need to understand that. Although, like I said, we can interpret it differently. But also, we need to understand that when we are when we are engaging these tough issues from different sides of the political spectrum, we need to be able to come together and be an agree to disagree. We need to be able to come in love. Um, a guy named David Gushy, and again, I really like David Gushy. He's an ethicist. He's a Baptist pastor. Um, and he wrote this book called Changing Our Mind, in which he went from his traditional understanding of the LGBTQ to a more affirming stance and why he did that. This week I was reading a really old article by, by David and uh, he was, it was the week after um, Eugene Peterson came out and seemed to indicate that he was changing his mind on the LGBTQ. Now, Eugene Peterson is, 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 a, is a great writer within Christendom. He is the one who translated the message translation. He has written so many books. Um, you know, it, there's, it's just amazing how much this guy has given to the Christian church. And so he was in his 80s, and he said, oh, you know, thinking I'm changing my mind. And what happened next, to be honest with you, totally embarrassed me. Gushy talked about it in his article. He said, Eugene Peterson discovered painfully what the evangelical establishment will immediately seek to destroy anyone who breaks with their understanding of orthodoxy and LGBTQ issues. Nothing he did before mattered. Nothing else he believes mattered. The guns were turned on him post-haste in a choreography of rejection as public and as painful as possible. This has happened so many times before that the real wonder of events last week was that Reverend Peterson somehow did not anticipate that it would happen to him. That Lifeway Christian stores would immediately add him to their ever-growing band author list. That the Inquisitor bloggers would post responses before breakfast. That his reputation would be threatened within, with ruin within hours in, a, in the community which he had served for decades. This is, the, this is evangelical, evangelical nuclear deterrence. And it works very well most of the time to beat wanderers and wa- wanderers and wanderers into submission. Create fear. Exactly what Brian McLaren had said. Somehow, we need to be able to find a way to have hard conversations without going to vast means of tearing each other down. Somehow. A new command I give you. Love one another. 
and this they will know that you are my disciples. Because whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you're Democrat or Republican, or new Democrat or social credit, whatever you are, you love one another. The problem is, is that we've been sold a line of hate so long in the church that we've lost the ability to say, okay, let's talk. Let's at least have the discussion. Let's agree to disagree. And I get that it's hard. Understand that. But we've been called to a life of love no matter what it is. And Jesus was experiencing the same thing in his world. He was experiencing this, this idea of contradiction. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses, sorry, teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife with no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no children, no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of at all, the women died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Since the seven were married to her. Looking for that next blank. It's angels dancing on the head of a pin. The clue to this story is actually in the first verse. Jesus came and was talking to Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. I mean, have you, I've, I've had that, I'm, I'm sorry, I've had that discussion. I've had people who don't believe in God come up and say, well, what about this? And I'm going, well, Okay, but you don't believe in God? We hit a verse this morning that talked about not being able to see the light of the gospel, that, we, that people have been blinded to the light of the gospel. And, and that's true. There are people who are blinded to this, and we need to pray that they, will, that they will someday see. But the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, were, were asking Jesus a question about the resurrection. And we get so tied up in this stuff. Doesn't evolution disprove, dis, disprove creationism and the Bible's origin, origin story? Can I just, can I give you the answer to this one? No. Emphatic no. One thing, they're written with two different purposes. Evolution, and I don't know whether evolution is true or not. There's still some holes in it. But it seems to be the theory of the day. But it talks about the mechanics of creation. The creationism, the, 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 the Genesis story does not talk about the mechanics of creation. It talks about the purpose of creation. It talks about the by who of creation. It starts off with the th only thing you need to know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God did it. How did he do it? He molded some dust and breathed into it. Take that as you will. If you find in that a description of, of evolution, I fully support you in that. But the two things are different. They're not the same thing. So when somebody who doesn't believe in God comes up to us and says, doesn't evolution disprove creationism? No, it doesn't. Two different purposes. How about this one? How can you believe in miracles when science explains how the world works? How can you not believe in miracles when science can't explain a lot of stuff in how the world works? Increasing knowledge. We believed 100 years ago, 150 years ago, we believed that increasing knowledge was going to make us happier. Guess what? It hasn't worked. And most people are starting to admit that now. 
Increase in knowledge did, did nothing to help us be happier. So let it go. There's still mystery that only God can explain. You, as smart as we are, you are more than the sum of your parts. Something mysterious has happened inside of you. We may be able to create AI. We may be able to create even a, a robot that can think, but we have not yet been able to create anything with the spirit that God has breathed into us. It is still that mystery that is present in the world. We still don't understand a lot of the questions. And even if we get those answers, it still doesn't say that God does not exist. We waste so much time on stupid arguments. We waste so much time on stupid arguments. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Do you know the answer to that? I don't. Does it matter? Am I not a Christian now because I can't answer that? How about this one? I, I love this one. Is, can God create a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? Can he? I don't know. See, that one seems to go either, either God can't do everything he can't create it, or he can't lift it. Either way, there's some sort of limitation here. But it's silly stuff. Stop worrying about stupid questions. We waste too much time on them. Jesus met the woman at the well, and I absolutely love this story. He comes to this Samaritan woman at the well, sends his disciples off. He sits there. She comes up at noon. Noon is not the time to go to the well. It's too hot. You come in the early morning and you come in the evening. You don't come at noon. But this woman had been ostracized. She had been kicked out. She wasn't welcome. And so she waited till noon to come to get the water when nobody was at the well. And she comes to this well in the noonday and she finds this Jewish rabbi sitting there. And she's not happy because nobody's supposed to be at the well at noon. But she needs the water, so she comes up anyways, and she starts taking water out of the well. And Jesus says, can I have a drink? And she says, how can you, a Jewish man, ask me if you can have a drink? Jesus basically says, because I'm thirsty. So she gives him a drink. And he says, you know, the day is coming when you will no longer have to come to this well to get drink. And they start talking about the coming of the Messiah and her belief in this coming of the Messiah. And Jesus says, I am he. She has been discarded by her community. She has been married five times. And the guy she was living with now was the sixth and not her husband. There were so many things that the religious establishment would have said is wrong with her. And Jesus comes to the well and talks to her and says this, you know what? The only person that's that is important is you. You have my attention. You have everything. I love you. I want more for you than sneaking out of your house at noon to come to get this well to come to get water out of this well. I want more for you than that. We get hung up on things when the only thing that really matters is you. God loves you. God loves the person sitting beside you regardless of, of your disagreements with that person or the one sitting behind you or the one sitting in front of you, the one who lives beside you where you live or down the block. 
God's focus is on people, not things. And actually not rules. Jesus came to the people that the religious establishment had thrown out because of their sin. And Jesus said, you know what? I love you anyways. And I want to welcome you into my kingdom. We can do better than this. Jesus replied, are you, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, you have not read the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Sorry, I need to point some, you out to something right now. Read that. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am, not I was. I am. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. That last blank is the God of, of life. We worry a lot about what happens after we die. And I get that. I understand that. It's the grand mystery. But sometimes we need to pause and think about what God has promised us. And sometimes I wonder if we get the whole thing wrong. When I was in about grade four, I don't know what you call it in grade four. Um, we called it uh, language arts in junior high and English in in, in senior high, but I can't remember what we called it in, in grade four. Language arts? No? Yeah? I had to write a poem. And so I wrote this poem, and my, I gave it to my teacher, and, and she was astounded by my wisdom. I'm not sure that I deserve the accolades that she gave to me. But it was really all over the last, the last line of the poem which basically said, is there death after life? And she wanted, to, she wanted to sit down with me, you know, and talk to me about this whole idea about whether there is death after life. I mean, what, I'm 10 years old? You want to have a philosophical discussion with me? But it's a question that has stuck with me. Is there death after life, or, or is it just a moving do we just simply continue to exist somewhere else? Several years ago, I don't know whether he used his real name or, his, or, or a fake name, but a gentleman passed away. We'll call him Scott. Um, Scott passed away, and I was, or uh, actually, Scott got sick, and I was going to see him. I needed to connect with him. So I, I drove to the hospital, and I couldn't find a parking spot. And so I you know, finally found a parking spot or a place I could leave my car. I wasn't sure that it was even a legal parking spot, so I was kind of thinking I might get a ticket, but I left the car where it was, and I kind of went into the hospital, and I went to the nurse's station. This is, I do this all the time. Even if you tell me what room you're in, I'll go to the nurse's station to make sure they haven't moved you. Cause there's nothing I like better than to walking into a room that, of somebody that I don't know when I'm expecting to find you. So I stopped the nurse nursing station, but there's nobody there. I waited for a couple minutes, and then finally a nurse was coming down the hall, and she said, who, you, who have you come to see? And I said, I've come to see Scott. And she said, well, he just passed away. You can go sit in his room if you want. Missed him by a couple minutes. So I went into his room, and I sat down, and I had a mentor of mine had once told me that the spirit of the person hangs around the body for a little while after the the person dies. I don't know whether that's true or not. You probably got it off some of these, you know, um, stories of people who died and came back to life. But I just, just in this moment, I remembered him, him telling me this. And so I, I sat down beside Scott, pulled the chair over. I remember I took his hand and just held it. And we talked, I, we talked, I talked 
about a few things. Um, I, I, I told him what an amazing person I thought that he was. He had a very unconventional mar- marriage. Um, some people, you know, when they get married, they like each other, but just can't live together. So Scott and his wife had discovered that they liked each other, but they couldn't live together. So they, at one point, I don't know when it happened, but this is the way it was when the whole time I knew Scott. Um, him and his wife got separate apartments across the hall from each other. They could still be friends, but they didn't have to live with each other. I thought, you know, that's an amazing way, an amazing testimony of how to live with somebody, you know, even when things have gone wrong. I told him a few other things, just kind of what was on my heart. And then I sat and I read Psalm 121. I opened up my Bible. I said, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of, of heaven and earth. And then I recited the Lord's Prayer. Why don't you, will you read, read this with me? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, sorry, in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Recognize that one line? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's in green. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not the valley of death. It's the valley of the shadow of death. Even here, death is is not quite real. Jesus says, my Father, God, is the God of life. His focus is on you. And maybe, and I, I can't prove this with any Bible verses, but maybe that day as I was sitting there holding Scott's hand, that Scott didn't necessarily die, but he, he went from one plane of reality to another. And God was still his God because in some way Scott was still alive, just not here. We focus on stupid things. Stupid arguments that don't matter. God's focus has always been and will always be you, the person. The person who struggles to pay the bills. The one who struggles to get up in the morning or to go to bed at night. The one that worries about his future or her bills. His focus is on you. Always has. Always will. Here's the truth. Whether you are a conservative or a liberal, here it is. Your past, the stuff that happened yesterday and before, God's forgiven that. The Bible says if you've asked, if you've repented and asked him to forgive it, he forgives it and he separates you as far as you can from as far as the east is from the west. That's pretty far. Your past is forgiven. Your future is still in his hands. It hasn't arrived yet. What he has given you is today. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have enough worries of its own. Just enjoy God's gift of today. 
What are you doing with that gift? Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us even when the pastor's long-winded. That you love us enough to be our God and to focus on us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for focusing on me. For allowing me to be who you made me. For focusing on my friends who have gathered in this place. The ones who are, who are watching this on Facebook. God, thank you for them and for focusing on them. And God, may we do what you intend with this gift of today that you have given to given us. Help us to stop arguing over stupid things and just loving each other the way you taught us. And we know that with the power of your spirit residing in us that we can do this. That you will do this through us and that nothing else matters. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Why don't you stand with us? You know this song. Let's sing it together. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit lives within me Because you died and rose again I'm forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you I'm forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted I'm accepted you were condemned. I'm alive, I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, amazing love. Die for me, would die.
honor you. Amazing love, amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Would die for me. Amazing love, amazing love. I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You. for that amazing love God the love that you gave to us when you sent your son to this earth to show us the way and God we thank you that when our walk on this earth is over that love will still be there for us and God we ask that you allow us to go out of this place and share that love with everyone we meet we ask this in Jesus name Amen Amen first question what was it what was the question? What, what was the question? What are we supposed to give to God? What belongs to Him? Yep. Good. And question number two. Emelina? What kind of arguments do we waste time on? Stupid arguments, yeah. Amen. Josiah, you got question number three? <laughs> okay. Henry. Loudly, you're a long ways away from me. 
What valley do we walk through? The valley of the shadow of death. Great. Okay, I'll have something up for you up here uh, just when we finish the service, okay? See you there. All right, we just want to remind you, if you have tithes and offerings, you can send them in an e-transfer to vpccitreasure at outlook.com or drop them in the box here on your way out. But why don't you stand with us one more time as we end with one more song.
the story. As we return now to our homes, workplaces, and communities, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your beauty all around us. May we hear and smell and see and touch your glory evident in all of your creation. Above all, let us see your beauty, even in the brokenness of our brothers and sisters all of them created in your image and waiting to experience that redemption that comes only through Christ Jesus our Lord. We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks for coming. We thank you for spending part of your Sunday with us. We hope you'll come next week again, Thanksgiving Sunday, uh, 11 o'clock right here at Vantage Point and of course on Facebook. Until then, grace and peace. Have a great week.